tonight we're in the book of Isaiah, the book of Isaiah chapter 9, chapter 9, the book of Isaiah chapter 9, and we're going to be looking uh, at this second message as we preach this morning. Uh, we've said this could be a, a mini series for Christmas, so it would be our Christmas series. Tonight we're going to look at his prophecy. This morning we looked at his person, and as we looked at his person, we uh, saw the identity of Christ. Tonight in his prophecy, we'll see the introduction of Christ, uh, the message behind the introduction of Christ as those prophets introduce the Lord Jesus Christ. I will say to you, as I've said in uh, recent days, Jesus is coming again. Amen. When we think about uh, this thought of the Lord and his prophecy, his coming the first time, uh, and even uh, the second time, as it uh, the first time was prophesied, this next time we have a promise in God's word, uh, it will come to pass. And lest I, lest I forget to say it or do not say it later on in this message, I will say it now. The promises and the performances of God are one in the same. Now, I've told you that before, but I want you to remember that. I don't want you to forget about that. When God makes a promise... It's already performed. And God has said he's going to come again. Just as the prophecy of the Old Testament that we'll see about his first coming, uh, when he does come again, he is going to come. And uh, as I said, that first coming, he came to redeem us, but he's coming the next time to rescue or rapture us out. And then the second coming of the Lord, when he comes back to this earth, he'll be ruling and reigning. Hallelujah. And thank God we'll be with him. Amen. What a glorious time that will be. So you found the reading there in Isaiah chapter 9. Let's look at it as we see the prophecy of, uh, of Christ and is seen uh, in the Old Testament and as we look at these scriptures. We read this verse this morning, verse 6, but we'll also read verse number 7. And from this we'll give you our message tonight. The Bible said, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Do you remember now, I just told you just a few moments ago, the promises and the performances of God are one and the same. When God promises you something, it's not like mama did uh, or daddy did or grandpa or grandma did when we were children and, and even our children. Uh, you know, our children will probably, that when they want something from mom and daddy, they'll come to us, and, and I'm sure that when our grandson gets old enough where he can really talk, he'll come to us and he'll want things, and, and what they'll usually say, are you going to promise me that you're going to do it? Will you promise me that you'll give me this, or will you promise me that you're going to take me this place? Well, I'm going to tell you what. Moms and dads, sometimes their promises are not going to perform. They're not going to follow through. Amen. Uh, you say, well, I'll just tell them I'll do this just to get them on my back right now. But, but you think about the promises and the performances of God are one and the same. This is a prophecy. And lest I forget to tell you this later on, I may re revert back to it. But right here in the very first two phrases of this verse, let me just read it to you again. Catch hold of the emphasis of what's said. Here's Isaiah, some 740 some odd years before Christ was ever born, physically speaking, taken upon that body of flesh. Notice, the, notice what he said. For unto us a child, he didn't say will be given, but he said is born, is born. Notice that. And unto us a son is given. You know what Isaiah was saying? The promises and the performances of God are one and the same. In other words, in Isaiah's heart, in Isaiah's mind, and when I was reading that, I, I've read that verse many times, but I've never seen it like that. Never really thought of it like that. But Isaiah was already saying, as far as I'm concerned, God's already here. Amen. So he says, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. And his name shall be called, we went through these this morning, Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Verse 7, 
And of the increase of his government and and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. As I said, God's promised us. And here's a prophecy. But what God has promised us will always come through. I, I, I remember... Uh, years ago, there was a bumper sticker that came out and uh, it was put upon the back windshields and on the bumpers of many cars. God said it. I believe it. That what? Settles it. You remember that? God said it. I believe it. And that settles it. Well, I had an old-fashioned preacher that I sat under all my life uh, preaching the gospel and that came out and everybody was putting them on their cars and, and everybody was uh, putting them on their bumpers and, and riding them around and they were printing up T-shirts and things about it. God said it. I believe it. That settles it. I never will forget the Sunday. He stood up and he said, I know this is out there and some of you are probably not going to like what I'm going to say. He said, but it's wrong. And everybody just got really quiet just like you are right now. And we listened and he said, For here's the truth to all of this. If God says it, whether you believe it or not, that settles it. And I said, as a young man, I said, well, I never thought about it that way either. And thank God for an old man of God. Hey, it'll just give you something from the Word of God. If God says it, friend, it's going to happen. Are you with me now? So when these prophets, they spoke concerning the prophecy... They didn't really always know the full extent and the application of even their message. But they had trust in God in knowing if God had given them that through the inspiration of the Spirit of God when they said it, when they wrote it down, that it was going to come to pass. So I told you, he said here, just like Isaiah, he said a child is born and a son is given And so when God speaks, it will come to pass. We're going to look at a couple of two or three different things. First of all, we're going to see the doctrine of this prophecy. The doctrine of this prophecy concerning Christ. We'll notice in in this verse, which I've just given you that, that phrase, it said, a child is born and a son is given. There is the dual nature of Christ right here in this verse. He talks of him as a child. He speaks of him as a son. You say, well, preacher, what, what does it mean? That first phrase, a child is born, speaks of the humanity of Christ. According to John chapter 1 and verse 14, where we were this morning, the Bible talks about him who is Jesus, stepped out of the portals of glory in the throne room of heaven and came to be born as he took upon a body of flesh just like us. Why? The Bible said to dwell among us, to live among us. And uh, if he had come out as a spirit, hey, nobody had been able to identify. But he took upon a body of flesh, was born as a babe, as a child, and laid in that manger. He's wrapped in swaddling clothes. And of course, Mary and Joseph uh, were his earthly parents to be able to take care of him uh, while he was here. And so that first phrase, a child is born, speaks of the humanity of Christ. We're talking about the dual nature of Christ. And then the second phrase, a son is given. That speaks of his deity. You say, what do you mean by that? Let me just go to one of the most familiar verses of all the Bible, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten, what? Son. And that speaks of his deity because it's God's son. And so you see his humanity, his deity. You have the earthly side attached to his humanity, but you have the eternal side attached to his deity. For he was, he is, and he always will be. Now some of what we said uh, this morning will kind of overlap to what we're going to say tonight, or this tonight will overlap what we said this morning. But we think about his dual nature. We see something about the delegation noted of Christ. The Bible said in verse number 6, when it was speaking there, uh, for unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. Notice this here. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. Now the delegation noted here shows us two things about this. When it speaks of the government. Uh, shall be upon his shoulders. When it speaks of government, it talks about his prominence. When we think about uh, prominent people in our society, 
Our government officials are prominent people. If one of our delegates showed up, uh, we would we would recognize that individual in saying they are a representative, they are uh, of this delegation for this state. And so when it talks about the government, it talks about his delegation of Christ here, as it's noted, and it talks about his prominence. But it not only talks about his prominence here, it talks about his power. Notice here, and the government, in other words, all the prominence, shall be upon his shoulder. And when you think about his shoulders here, that that speaks of authority uh, and power. So not only his prominence, but his power here. So we move from the dual nature of Christ and the delegation noted of Christ, we move to the divine names of Christ in chapter, in, in verse number 6 of chapter 9. And now these great names, I gave you some of those names this morning, uh, not listed here, we went over these, but yet I gave you some other names of Christ, told you about those books that I have uh, by that writer and by that author who compiled all these four series and four books on the names of Christ. And he makes notation about each of these. Now here the Bible gives us these and we'll look at them. And his name shall be called. The first one is wonderful. There's a meaning to that. I'll give you that in a moment. Then counselor. We'll go over that one. The mighty God, the everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. Now let's go back over these. The first one is wonderful. Here you have the marvelous one. And I say to you, he is marvelous. Now, it's just not that he's a babe. Now, when we think about babes in the manger, and that's what everybody celebrates at Christmas, Jesus being born in the manger. And we all celebrate that, and that's fine. I've got nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with that. But, hey, listen, he didn't stay a baby. He grew up. His purpose was not to come and be born in the manger, although he had to go through that process. But that wasn't the final purpose. As we know from the Word of God, the purpose was the cross. Going back to John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting what, church? Life. And so as he died on the cross, that was his purpose of coming. He was born, but he didn't stay a baby. I don't worship a baby in the manger. I worship the Lord of glory tonight as you do. And so when you think about these names, wonderful. He is the marvelous one. And these divine names of Christ ring out loud and clear to the heart of that sinner uh, who will trust Christ as his Lord and Savior and be saved. I want to tell you what, that name, hey, if somebody talks about the Lord Jesus and reading through this, when we get going through these names, I get excited because he is wonderful. He is the marvelous one. He's the one that saved my soul from hell, redeemed my life from destruction. Freedom. He's the one that set me on the straight and narrow path. He's the one that pulled me out of the miry clay of sin, set me on a solid rock, hallelujah. Wrote my name down in glory, amen. He is the marvelous one. We think about him being wonderful in that of his love and his wonderful sacrifice on the cross, him saving us and his keeping power that keeps us, that helps us, and he sure is a faithful God. So we think about this. No one is more wonderful than Jesus the marvelous one. Now let's look at that next name. He's not only the wonderful, he's called the counselor. When you think about the counselor, where as being wonderful, that's the marvelous one. Well, he's a counselor. He's a mentoring one. In other words, he, he counsels us. He mentors us along life's way. Hey, listen, I wouldn't be here tonight if it wasn't for him. As I said this morning, if he hadn't have helped me along the way, life's way, I can't depend on everybody, but I always can depend on Jesus. Can I have a help? Come on now. And he's one that counsels us, uh, uh, counsels us along the way. He's the great, mighty, wonderful one, the marvelous one. He's the counselor, the mentoring one. When we think about him, he'll counsel us. And his counsel, I like this. I've written this down in my notes. His counsel will anchor the drifting soul. His counsel will redeem the ruined life. His counsel will deliver the drowning life. His counsel will lift the laden soul. His counsel will do all that and even more. I love sometimes to be able to look and uh, I, I do go on Facebook. I don't do it as much as some folk do those things and, and there's nothing wrong with that if you do it in the right way. But I have seen on that as well as the internet and things about before and after pictures of individuals. Folks who have been 
strung out on drugs or alcohol or some uh, treacherous thing in their life that they've done as far as sin is concerned. And they, they, they have a picture there, but uh, they, they, there's another picture that's attached to that, to that uh, uh, post on Facebook. And that post is, this is where I was, but this is where I am now. You say, what do you mean? They, they've met the wonderful, marvelous one, the counselor who is the mentoring one, the one that will mentor them and help them and bring them through those troublesome times. Therefore, you'd have a rough individual that looked rough. Uh, somebody that looked undesirable and their body was all uh, battered up. But now God has made them beautiful. Why? Because they got off with all that junk. They turned to the Lord and God helped them. I tell you what, hey, listen, if you want, hey, you want to look better, act better, talk better, be better, get with Jesus. Because he's the marvelous one, the wonderful one. He's the counselor. And we're thankful for that. Now notice the next name here. He's not only wonderful, and he's also the counselor. That's the marvelous one, the mentoring one. But he's the mighty God. Well, that's the mighty one. I'm glad he's mighty. And he's got power. And he's able to do all things. Amen. For the children of Israel, as they stood at the Red Sea, uh, they said, what are we going to do? Somebody used the phrase, we're, in a, we're between a rock and the hard place. No, they were between the sea and, and the devil coming up behind them in Pharaoh's army. Moses said, just stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. God takes and parts that. You're talking about the mighty one. He parts the waters. Aren't, are you listening to me? He takes and parts that Red Sea. Not, it wasn't a creek. It wasn't a, a reedy marsh. It was the Red Sea, and he parts that. And, and, and the great mighty wind, which is a representation of the Holy Spirit of God, just blows through there and dries out the land. Hallelujah. In other words, they didn't walk through and have mud all in their sandals. They was walking their own. They was walking through that on dry ground. I'm talking about the mighty God tonight. Amen. I don't know if you're getting excited. I am. Some of you are looking at me like, yeah. But he is the marvelous one. He is the mentoring one. He is the mighty God. And the children of Israel were able to walk on dry ground. I can, just, I can see some of them little boys walking with mom and daddy walking through there. And there they are. It's like, a, that's the first aquarium. Live aquarium. The waters are congealed on either side. You say, preacher, I just don't believe all that. Well, this is Larryology. Follow it and let's go on. They're all there. And they're looking. There them fish are looking at them. And I can just see some of them boys saying, Bloop. punching in the water. Look, hey, let that go. Man, God will just get mad at us and swallow us up. Don't you do that. Don't touch that, boy. You know, they want to punch them fish and point at them fish and poke at them. Go, look at them fish, Daddy. Can you imagine that? You say, you say, well, see, when we read stories like that, sometimes we think about our mighty God. Oh, he just part, and they went across. Man, that was, a, that was an adventure. They didn't even have to pay for it. Didn't cost them a bit. Saw all the species of fish. Aquarium. Walking through the Red Sea on dry ground now. What a mighty God we serve, folks. I'm telling you, you ought to be excited about that. So he is the marvelous one. He is the mentoring one. He is the mighty one. He, he's our God. I like, you think about this now. We're thinking about Christmas. When those, listen, there's a child now, a young child. He's grown up a little bit. He's a young child. Hey, when those men came, uh, the Bible said uh, over there in Matthew, he, he said later on, that they fell down when they finally found him because they had come to do something. They come to bring. When they finally found him, they came and they fell down and worshiped him. Why? Because he's mighty God. He said, well, he's just a child. He's still the mighty God. They came to worship him. They recognized a little bit of his deity. Thank God for that. And they fell down to worship him. What a mighty God we serve. Let's look at the next thing. He's not only the wonderful, marvelous one, He's the counselor, the mentoring one. He's the mighty God, the mighty one. But he's also the everlasting father. He's the ministering one. The title here again speaks of his eternal existence and even the eternal existence of Jesus Christ. He is, he is justifiably described as the one which he is, as Revelation tells us, Revelation 1-4, which he is and which was and which is to come. Then you notice the next one. He's the prince of peace. You say, what do you mean by that? 
Well, if he's the marvelous one, he's the wonderful. He's counselor. He's the mentoring one. He's the mighty one in the mighty God. He's, he, is, he is the one uh, who is the everlasting father, the ministering one. Well, here, under the Prince of Peace, he's the maintaining one. If you can bring peace to a situation and you can maintain some things, hallelujah. Are you ever getting a fight with your family? Maybe brothers and sisters getting a fight? Brothers on brothers or whatever, and sisters on sisters. They just get in a fight, children just get all. But if you can come in and, and get them to settle down and get some peace along the way while they're in total turmoil, you, you, you're going to be looked at and you're going to be seen as, as the maintaining one. Boy, you, how did you maintain the peace? I said, I bought pizza. Hey, Amen. Gave them all pizza. <laughs> uh, then, then, then they're going to fight over the last piece. Hey, Amen. Again. But he is the one who is the prince of peace. He is the maintaining one. Christ who is, also, who, who's, who is in reality the source and champion of true peace. And when the birth of Christ was announced, you remember what the angel said to the shepherds in Luke 2.14, And on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. All men. He is the maintaining one. He is the one who is peaceful. And so when he was here on earth, he was the prince of peace. When he comes again, he'll establish total peace. I think about this thought of, of peace and uh, the peace of God, the peace uh, when, you, when you speak about him as the prince of peace. There's three distinct uh, uh, positions of peace here. There is the peace with God. Having peace with God. And the Bible talks about that. There's verses. We won't go into the verses. But there's verses in the Bible that talks about peace with God. That is only through Jesus Christ. Friend, if you're ever going to make peace with God, it'll be through Jesus. If we're going to have any peace uh, with the Heavenly Father, it'll be through Jesus Christ. There's not only the peace with God, but there's the peace of God. That's with Christ. And then there's also the peace from God, from Christ. And so we think about the, the, the doctrine of his prophecy. Let's look at number two in verse number seven. Number two in verse number seven. The Bible said in verse seven, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Uh, he said, upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom, to order it, to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Let's look at the second thing. We've seen the doctrine of his prophecy. Let's look at the second thing. This will be the last one. The dominion or the power of the prophecy concerning Christ. When you think about the doctrine that we've just looked at in verse number 6 of this prophecy concerning Christ, that gives you his authentication. When you think about the dominion of this prophecy concerning Christ, that gives you his authority. We've authenticated him as Lord. He's wonderful. He's counselor, the mighty God, prince of peace, everlasting father. He's all of those things and more. That's his authentication. But now you see his power, his power, his authority. As we just read in verse number seven, let's look at the declaration concerning his dominion or power. Increased progress or potential. The Bible said of the increase of his government. All of that, all of that uh, uh, providence and all of that uh, precedence that he has and all that power. He said there shall be no end. It's going to be increased. You think of this. All of the other rulers of the world uh, have, have come. And when you think about that, they began. But sooner or later, all the other rulers in the world, uh, their power began to de decrease. But his won't. The Bible said there'll be no end to it. There'll be the increase. No ending to his power. No ending to his government. All those other dictators of the world, either by opposing forces, open failure, or obvious fatality through death, they have went off the scene. But not him. Not Jesus. I'm saying he is. He was. And he shall be. Amen. Why? Because he's forever. And that's the God we serve. When we think about this prophecy, you see his doctrine concerning that. You see his dominion concerning that. His rule and dominion, the Bible tells us here, will increase and there shall be no end. The largeness, the luster, the length, and the, and the continuality of this increase, it will go on forever. Somebody put it like this, the size and serenity and splendor and the span of it will last forever. So his rule 
It'll spread from Zion to the whole world and universe for he is the mighty God and the mighty king. So you think about his increased uh, potential and progress in, uh, in his dominion, in his power, the declaration. Let's think about his infinite peace. Again, he's mentioned about peace here. In verse number 7, it said, And peace there shall be no end. Think about that. What do we got in today's society? No peace. Now the world is crying for it. World peace. All those beauty pageants. You remember beauty pageants at the end? They'll, they'll get up and they'll give them some questions. And all those beauty pageants. And at the end of that, whatever their questions were, and they're not supposed to know their questions that they're going to be asked, but they have to answer it. And, and then at the end, they'll say, and we want world peace. Those beauty queens, we just want world peace. Everybody wants world peace. We want peace around the house. We want peace at the church. We want peace at home on our job. We want it to be peaceful. Everybody's crying for it. We got a world that's not peaceful tonight. You say, why, preacher? Because right now, according to the book of Ephesians, God has allowed Satan and those powers to come in, the principalities of the powers of the air, and he's stirring things up. But there's coming a day. It's not over yet, church. You say, preacher, what are we going to do if 2020 doesn't end out like we, like we think it ought to and ushering into 2020? What are we going to do if the government goes in another direction? If everything's done, don't worry about it. We serve the Prince of Peace. Amen. Hallelujah. And he's promised that one day he's going to settle the score. There's a lot of judges that are making a lot of decisions these days. But those judges don't have total power. He's got total power. And one day he's coming back. And when he does come back and set up his kingdom here on earth, there's going to be total peace. Why? Because the prince of peace will be right here. <laughs> Won't be no problems then. You say, preacher, what are we going to do until then? Hey, we're just going to keep on fighting for Jesus. Amen. We're more than conquerors in him and with him. Infinite peace as the world cries for it. Uh, they won't. Uh, you, they, 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 say, they say this: if if we just all abided with global warming, we'll have peace. Global warming ain't got this thing's gonna get warm. I want to tell him every time I hear that on TV. I want to jump in the, I just jump up in the floor and and you know yell at the TV. Hey, this thing's gonna get hot. It's gonna burn up one day. Read your Bible. And all these people trying to figure it out. If we just had, glow, you know, if everybody paid more close attention to global warming and climate change, we'd have more world peace. If we just stopped worrying about, uh, you know, uh, who's in this country and don't worry about the threats that pose to our religious freedoms and all of that. Don't worry. We'd just have world peace. No, you're not going to have that. Not until the Prince of Peace comes. I'll give you a couple of two or three verses here what the Bible said about the last days. Then we're going to be through here in a minute. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, let me give you this. Verse 1, he said, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. That means the last days before the Lord comes. There's going to be perilous times. Uh, we're not going to run around. We're not going to have, uh, hey, this thing's not going to get better. It's going to just get worse and worse. I hope I've just encouraged you tonight. Amen. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. That's happening today. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. Can I have a witness? Unthankful, can I have another witness? Unholy, that's going on. Without natural affection, my Lord. Truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce despisers of those things that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. That's why the church ain't full. Amen. I just want to love something else, do something else. Oh, but preacher, I'll just do Sunday morning or maybe Wednesday night or this, that. Listen, hey, just love the love life more than to do God. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers lusts. Boy, there's a big message there. I'm going to preach that one day. But this passage continues on when you think about peace. He said there's going to be infinite peace. 
There'll be no peace, as I said, till the Prince of Peace comes. And he talks not only about, uh, has he, in, he talks about that included and, and prosperous uh, progress that will happen, the infinite peace, but there's in, inherited pedigree here, I see. Because he said in verse number 7, you go back to your text verse, he said, upon the throne of David. He is the Son of God. As I said, when he came and he was born in the lineage of David, you read the scriptures there and it tells you of the lineage of David and he has, he has the inheritance to the throne and one day, hey listen, he's going to sit on that throne again. We've talked about that. The intelligent uh, prudence and purity, look at the rest of verse number 7, and, and upon his kingdom to order it, he said. He said to establish it with judgment and justice from henceforth even forever. When it talks about upon his kingdom to order it, that refers to his omniscience, that he is all-knowing. It shows us how that he will establish. He talks about judgment and justice. This refers to how he will rule. When you think about judgment, that means to bring matters to, to, to right and those things which have been wrong, he will make them right. He'll administer judgment like a magistrate or a governor. When it, thinks about, when it talks about justice, that means to be just and to be righteous. And there's two main thoughts here. That judge who is honorable and that judge uh, who is holy, he will rule and reign on this earth. Thank God. He is both and he will bring justice and judgment accordingly. And then we think about his uh, innate power there. The last phrase of verse number 7, look at it now. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. You say, well, preacher, what do you mean by that? Let me just give you this thought here. I'll give you this in closing. Ain't nobody like him. He's God, and he's going to take care of it all. Not only is his person which identifies him, but his prophecy introduces him. What an introduction. Because he is wonderful. He's a counselor, the mighty God. He's a prince of peace, the everlasting father. Boy, he's just wonderful tonight. And he's got it all wrapped up, friend. You don't have to worry a bit, a bit about him because he's got it all together. You may be falling apart, but he's intact. You may be nervous. He's not nervous at all. He doesn't have to worry. Listen, you may have to take a pill to go to bed at night. <laughs> but God's in control. I tell you what, it'll be all right, church. Jesus is in control. He came the first time. And he is coming again. Hallelujah.